to introduce yourself um, in the chat for now and over the next few minutes um, with one, the city you currently reside in, two, why you decided to join us for the mini series today, and three, what is something you are hoping to learn from this series? So if y'all can go ahead and start introducing yourself in the chat, we will start by introducing ourselves as well. Um, so we're gonna go over briefly the agenda for today. We're gonna start off by introducing our facilitators, sharing our community agreements, talk about why we are doing this mini series. Then we're going to give an introduction to public narrative and the story of self. We're going to draft and practice our own stories of self, and then we'll share and debrief stories of self in our large group um, when we come back at the end and talk through some next steps. So um, I'll get us started off with introductions here. Um, and then pass it on to my co-facilitators. My name is Naomi Cohen Shields. I use she, her pronouns. I'm the DC campaigns manager at CCAN based in Washington, DC in Ward 1 for those who are around here. Um, and for me, I'm really looking forward to the aspect of this organizing mini series that allows us to get to know each other. Um, I think I'm always really encouraged and inspired by what brings other people to this work. That reminds me what what brings me here as well. Um, and I think can really help keep our spirits high. Um, and so, yeah, looking forward to hearing from all of you. Uh, I'll pass it along to Xander. Thanks, Naomi. My name is Xander. I use he, him pronouns. I'm CCAN's Northern Virginia organizer. And the part about this that I'm looking forward to is I think there'll be a moment sometimes over the next four weeks where one of us will find something that just clicks with them. And I'm excited to see that happen in real time. Um, and I will pass it to, oh, I'm joining from Fairfax, Virginia. And I'll pass it to Charles. Thanks, Xander. Uh, yeah, so my name is Charles Brown II. I am the Hampton Roads organizer for CCAN. I use he, him pronouns, and I work out of the North Virginia office. Um, I think the part of this that is uh, really exciting to me is uh, that uh, through doing this series will uh, hopefully help you guys learn how to to, to build upon the, the skills that you'll be learning from this training and to see everybody grow within it and to see what you guys do with this new skill set will be just amazing, I think. So very excited um, for you guys to be joining us, and uh, I'll pass it off to Mustafa. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, my name is Mustafa. Uh, he, my pronouns are he, him, and I am the field director for CCAN. Um, and um, I'm very excited about this Organizing 101 series just because um, I get to see, as I said in the chat, all these folks like yourselves who want to help move other people into climate action. I'm seeing things about like persuasion. I'm seeing like uh, how to get, you know, uh, move people into doing progressive work. I'm seeing uh, people who are talking about like not being sure about what to do to address the climate crisis, and all of all of these and so many more are the reasons why we're we're doing this uh, organizing 101 series. Yeah, thanks, thanks all for introducing yourselves in the chat. Uh, just echoing what Lisa said, it's awesome to see so many folks from here from across our geographies. Um, but with very similar reasons for coming here today. Um, so thanks for introducing yourselves. If you haven't yet, please continue to do so. We'll be using the chat quite a bit throughout this mini series. Um, so if you have any questions or comments, feel free to put them in the chat and one of us will respond to you there. Um, I'll pass it over to Charles now. Thank you, Naomi. Okay, so we're going to hop into uh, community agreements. All right, so follow along. Uh, in the confirmation email you received a few days ago, we asked for you all to review community agreements uh, that will help make uh, this a great training for everyone. I'd like to go around and have four different people read these community agreements and ask that everyone agree to these. Please raise your hand if you can read one. Um, and so we'll be looking for our first brave soul. I think I see Aaron O's hand first. Go for it, sir. Awesome. Um, a safe space, a brave space. Learning new things can be uncomfortable and challenging. 
requiring us all to be brave and step into our own discomfort, but our ability to be brave rests on a foundation of feeling safe, of being seen, heard, and respected. Wherever possible, strive to build a space that is both safe and brave. Thank you for that. Um, and we'll move to number two. I see Richard. How you doing, Richard? Good to see you. Good to see you. Number two, uh, take space, make space. Be aware of the space you are or are not taking up. If you have been participating a lot, try making space for others. If you have not participated very much, try taking up more space. All right. Thank you for that, Richard. Uh, I also see Ting. Take it away. What's shared here stays here. What's learned here leaves here. People may share things about themselves and their stories that are personal. Let's hold confidentiality for one another by only sharing our learnings, not other people's stories outside of this space. Thank you for that. And number four, I see Mary Jo. Take it away. Be present and lean in. Engage meaningfully and authentically in the conversation that's going on in the virtual rooms, not the one on your phone. All right, thank you, Mary Jo. Um, so with all of that being said, can I get a thumbs up from everybody who agrees to these community agreements? That means organizers as well. I put a little razzle dazzle, did a little thing with my thumb there. All right, so with that being said, thank you guys for agreeing to that. Um, and I will pass it off to Mustafa. Thanks, Charles. <clears throat> So we're launching the Organizing 101 mini-series uh, because we want to just continue to build a powerful grassroots organizing infrastructure um, that is grounded uh, by uh, organized teams of people on the ground who, who are driving the work. And so as, as we've discussed uh, in power hours and in membership meetings, uh, we want to build the semi-autonomous CCAN action member teams with you know core teams of somewhere between three to seven people in our in your communities that um where that we are working in to build power and take on local climate justice campaigns and CCAN priority campaigns. So however, in order to get there, we need to train our volunteers on the tactics that we need to do our base building and outreach and to create stronger, tighter knit community uh, uh, you know a community of of volunteer activists. So, um, should have gone to my next slide. Sorry, I'm trying to multitask here, going from uh, slides and uh, other things I'm looking at. So, um, there's for 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 the du for the duration of the rest of this training series. I think the the series of questions that we're both going to engage in, both intellectually and in terms of our skill, can be summed up in the questions posed by the first. Uh, first century uh, uh, sage, uh, Jewish sage, Rabbi Hillel, um, which the questions are, if I'm not for myself, who am I? When I'm only for myself, what am I? And if not now, when? So these three questions, they focus on the interdependence of self, other, and action. So what am I called to do? What are others with whom I'm in relationship called to do? And what action does the world in which we live demand of us now? I wanna take a second for folks to, to just share uh, in the chat or people can come, come, off the, come off mute. Why do we think that these are actually posed as questions and not statements? Can you repeat that? I'm sorry, Gustavo. Yeah, why do we think this is? These are posed. Rabbi Hillel is posing us, posing questions to us, rather than just making a statement. So you can find out who your true self is. That's exactly right. Right, we're we're acting. We're we as individuals are entering a world of uncertainty. The climate crisis epitomizes the world of uncertainty, the unpredictable, and so. To, we don't we don't we know that we can't control it um we have to learn to embrace the uncertainty in the moment that we're in and the uncertainty poses particularly of climate change poses challenges to the scale that we've never seen before challenges 
to our head, to our heart, and to our hands. And so what we, um, what we uh, talk about uh, in organizing, and as, as, uh, as Professor Marshall Gans describes and defines in the, treat, in the participant to, uh, guide that I've pr provided to you all, that leadership requires, quote, accepting responsibility for enabling others to achieve purpose under conditions of uncertainty. So what is organizing? I wanna offer up this definition, that organizing is a form of leadership that enables a constituency to turn its resources into the power to achieve its goals through recruitment, training, and development of leadership. Now, organizing is about equipping people, the constituency with, with the, that we're organizing with the power to make change. So there are five principles of organizing that are that are fundamental and really for this organizing training series, we're gonna be focusing on two. Um, but the five are having a shared story, uh, or starting off with having a shared story, number one. Number two is relational commitment. Number three is a clear leadership structure. And number four is creative strategy to be successful in building power and achieving your goals. And number five is developing an effective uh, action. So for this mini series, as I said, we're going to focus on the first, the first two, uh, primarily shared story and relational commitment. So the first one, shared story, we're organizing is motivated by shared values. So uh, and we uh, that this and we like to think about it as shared values that are uh, expressed through the practice of public narrative. By learning the craft of public narrative, we can access our shared values for the emotional resources we need to respond to the challenges with courage rather than reacting to them with fear. So by learning to tell stories of our own values, known as the story of self, we, are, we enable other people to get us. Uh, by telling stories of the sources of the values that we share, which is the story of us, uh, we enable people to get each other, to understand each other. By recognizing the current moment as one of urgent choice and, and, and proposing a hopeful way forward, a story of now is what motivates, what motivates action. So values-based organizing, in contrast necessarily to just strictly issue-based organizing, invites people to uh, escape their issue silos and come together so that their diversity becomes an asset rather than something that's viewed as an obstacle. Um, so by learning how to tell public narrative uh, that bridges the self, us, and now, organizers enhance their own efficacy, we can create trust, uh, solidarity within our campaign with constituent, with, with people that we're organizing with and equipping them to engage others just far more effectively. So the number two is creating the shared relational commitment. So organizing is based on relationships and creating these mutual commitments to work together. Um, so we create associations. These associations are what make us uh, greater than the sum of our parts. And so we learn to cast aside just our individual interests as, uh, to recast, I should say, our individual interests as uh, shared interests, as common interests, shared values, a shared vision for the world that we're trying to build and, and figuring out together a shared way to access the resources that we have to build the world that we're seeking. So relationship building is one of the, uh, particularly in, um, as it's, you know, through the tactic of doing one-on-one -on -one meetings, uh, creates the foundation of building local campaign teams that are rooted in commitments people are making to each other and not simply to the issue of climate change but I'm trying to make get people to make commitments to each other. So let's go to the next section and I'm gonna pass it off to Charles. Thank you, sir. All right, so what is a uh, public narrative? Well, public narrative is a particular type of storytelling that was developed by longtime organizer and now Harvard professor Marshall Gans. It has been used in campaigns around the country and the world to build community around shared values and inspire others to make to take meaningful action. As we mentioned earlier, we define leadership as about accepting responsibility for enabling others to achieve shared purpose in the face of uncertainty. Narrative is how we learn to access the moral resources, the courage to make the choices that shape our identities, 
as individuals, as communities, as nations. Um, excuse me while I scroll. Um, let me see. So uh, can someone tell me what the three components uh, are of public narrative? You can come off. Uh, you can come off of mute for this. And hence, it's not a trick question. It is not a trick question. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> the, like the story of self, uh, the story of now, and the story yep. of us. Yeah. Bingo. Absolutely correct. Um, and so, what is the story of now? Um, it communicates an urgent challenge. Uh, you are calling uh, on your community to join it to join you in acting on now. A source, a source of hope. And the choice of a pathway to action, you call on others to join you in taking. So what is the story of us? Uh, the story of us communicates shared values often expressed through key choice points, founding moments, moments of crisis, of triumph, disaster, of resilience, of humor, excuse me, and of humor. Um, stories of us are accounts of events involving specific people, moments, events, words, etc. And then what is the story of self? All right, so each of us has compelling stories to tell. In some cases, our values have been shaped by choices uh, others, parents, friends, teachers have made. And if we have chosen how to deal with loss, even as we have found access uh, to hope, our choices have shaped our own life path. We've dealt with challenges as children, found our way to a calling, responded to needs, demands, and gifts of others, confronting leadership challenges in places of workshops, schools, communities, and work. And uh, with that, I will uh, toss it off to Xander. Hi, everyone. I have another, another slide that is not a trick question once we uh, tag to it. Um, so as you brainstorm how to tell your story of self, sometimes it's hard to know where to start. And something that we like to share with folks is this framework of challenge, choice, and outcome. And you can see it represented on the, on the slide here. Um, and so the first step in your story is that little tiny gray ball in the middle there. Think about a choice that the character made in the story, a choice that led to an outcome. Um, and that will really help uh, drive drive your story and make it uh, clear and impactful. Because what you're trying to do is show folks that we all have choices and inspire them that they can make a choice that aligns with their own values. So once you have your choice, use these questions to further hone your story of self. When you're thinking about the challenge, why did it feel like it was a challenge to you? What was so challenging about this challenge? And why was it something that you had to tackle and not someone else? When you think about your choice, think about why you made it. Where did you get the courage or not? Where did you get the hope or not? Did your parents, your grandparents, other community members or other people's lives inspire you to act in that moment? And how did it feel for you to make your choice? And then in the outcome, well, first of all, what happened? Um, and then how did that feel? And why did it feel that way? What did you learn by the outcome that happened? And what do you want to teach us, the people listening to your story? How do you want us to feel? So what can this look like? Um, we're gonna show you an example. Um, and this has a trigger warning attached. This video does talk about suicide. Um, if that is something that is triggering for you, please do what you need to do to take care of yourself. Um, we will come back in six minutes after that. Thanks, Sander. Um, I'm gonna play the video in a second. Um, what I want for you all to be, you, what you can, what would be helpful to you actually, is if you pull up your participant training guide, if you got that with you, you can look at page 24. And it's got a series of questions that are specific to this video that we're gonna delve into for a few minutes after watching it. But really think about where the story of self is, the story of us is, and the story of now. This is a full public narrative. And really think about the challenges, the choices, the outcomes that are packed into this next five minutes. And what are the details, the images, the values that you walk away from? Um, 
this is a good example of a public narrative. And, and as Xander mentioned, um, it, is, it is a challenging one. So do what you need to take care of, uh, care of yourself. Oh, and I should say, this was uh, done by uh, a humanist chaplain, now a humanist chaplain, James Croft. Uh, I think this was back in 2010. This is right after the uh, suicide of D Tyler Clementi. So this is like right after that. So this is this is that's the context. <laughs> Wow. 6.12 seconds. That's about how long it takes to fall 604 feet. And 604 feet is about how far Tyler Clementi fell after he jumped off the George Washington Bridge. Now, as we know, he took his own life because live video footage of him having a romantic encounter with another man was streamed live on the internet by his college roommate. Just one of a very long list of young people who have taken their lives because of anti-LGBT bullying in the past few weeks. Now, I never experienced anything like what Tyler went through when I was at school, but I was bullied for being gay. You see, when I was a kid, I was a ballet dancer, and every week I squeezed into a leotard and blue shiny hot pants. It was uh, quite an outfit, and I spent an evening practicing demi-pies and pirouettes, and I loved it. I loved the discipline, the music played on the old piano, the feel of the wood beneath my feet. I even secretly quite liked the outfit. <laughs> but my schoolmates and some of my teachers didn't like ballet as much as I did. And one of my teachers, a PE teacher, used to make fun of me. He used to say how girly I was, how dancing is not something that boys should do. I remember the sneer on his face as I walked past, and I remember that he was the first person to call me a fag, which at seven years old, I didn't really understand. I remember in high school how gay was only ever used as a term of abuse. And I remember one cold morning sitting in assembly while the principal intoned, homosexuals deserve our pity and our prayers. And I sat among hundreds of other boys thinking I was all alone in the world and that I was the only one who had this problem. Now, not everyone may have experienced something like that, but we all know, I think, what it means to feel alone, to feel like there's no one on our side. Perhaps you were too tall and the short kids made fun of you. Or perhaps you were too short and you got it from the taller ones. Or perhaps you were too smart or too dumb or from the wrong side of town or the wrong race. We all know, I think, even if just for a moment, what it feels like to think that there's no one on your side, to think that no one has your back. And all of us, if there are young people in our lives that we care about, can agree that we don't want this to happen to them. Imagine, if you can, what it must be like to come home and see a strange shape hanging from a tree in your backyard, twisting in the wind, the creak of the branch as it bends beneath the weight, and that feeling in your gut as you get closer and you realize what it is hanging there, who it is, who it was, because that was Seth Walsh. 13 who hung himself from a tree in his backyard. It was Billy Lucas who hung himself at his grandmother's house. And it was Raymond Chase who hung himself in his door. And it could have been your brother, your sister, your son, your daughter, or your friend. It could have been one of us. So I know, I, I only came out in March this year. After 10 years, 10 years after I first told my parents that I thought I was gay. And in those 10 years, I lost a lot of opportunities to make a difference. I was a high school teacher, and every day I wasn't out was a day I deprived the gay student of a positive role model. And I'm not willing to waste any more time. I have to act now. We have to act now. Because it isn't enough to let these things happen and then morph them afterwards. We need to catch these kids before they jump. And there is something we can do to help as a start. Journalist Dan Savage has started a campaign, the It Gets Better campaign, to send messages of hope to teenagers who are being bullied because they're gay or for whatever reason, that they should have hope for their future, that they do have something to live for. 
And I think that if we made such a video, as Harvard students with glittering careers ahead of us and sparkling degrees, then we could make a difference. So we need people to hold a camera, to share their stories, to do editing and sound, to stand in a big group and say it gets better. No contribution is too small. And if you want to get involved and you're an undergraduate, talk to Tevin here. Do you mind waving? Oh, hi. And he'll tell you how to get involved. And if you're a graduate student, or if you just want to come along from 5 to 7 p.m. in the Elliott Lyman Room in Longfellow Hall at the Education Schools campus, stand up and say, we're standing with these kids. We've got your back. Let's catch them before they jump. Thank you. I listen that so I've watched that video for years at this point, and every time um, it really hits me. Um, so uh, why does oh, I want to have a discussion with folks for a couple minutes? Um, folks can feel free to contribute in the chat or to uh, hop off mute. Um, why does James begin as he does? Why do we think he does that? He begins with, for those who don't remember, he, re he begins with the visual of Tyler Clemente committing suicide. Jumping on the deep line. down and grabs him to your soul. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Thank you for sharing that, Dara. Yeah. It's, well, he, he talks yeah. about the distance and you can almost see it. Yeah, that's right. The details. It's like you're there, you're on the bridge, you're in the moment. You know, the yeah. details bring you in. Like watching a movie. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And also it's it for for that moment, it's for that moment in time in 2010, uh it's the story is very relevant. I like people, a lot of people were aware of this story. It was national headlines. Um, what do you think, what was the the challenge and what, what was the challenge for, 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 uh, for, for James? What was his challenge? Well, his challenge was coming out. I mean, living with epilepsy, in the 70s um, was like living in the closet. Yeah. You weren't supposed to tell people you had epilepsy. When I had a seizure at school, I ended up being homeschooled. They didn't want to keep me in school. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, I can so relate to that fear because even now in my 60s, I'm just finally coming out because MAGA's made my epilepsy worse. And um, it's really hard living with a secret and having this constant anxiety and fear that it'll be exposed mm -hmm. and you don't have control over it. But also what he said, it brought back memories having worked so hard to be a dancer and being accepted into the Joffrey to then get a rare type of epilepsy. And Robert Joffrey died of AIDS. And I was remembering just so many people I love who died of AIDS. And it was like, well, it's a gay issue, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It was very, it was very emotional for me. And I could relate to so much of what James said it really yeah and what you said that Dara you're talking about first of all is really beautiful and thank you for sharing that's very very vulnerable thing for you to say um the uh, there's the there, there's the story of us piece in there right James talks about like being bullied and uh for who for who you are and like you're and you're connecting with a set of set of values 
that he's already talking about. Your my next question was going to be the sort of about the story of us and but the the challenge of the story of us is uh, in um, in both the both the suicides and the problems with the consequences of bullying, but also empowering these young people to be themselves and like having positive role models. Um, so um, really, really, so um, really appreciate folks sharing sharing those things. I want to uh, highlight right just before we move on that as Ruth was alluding to, like ah, as Ruth was alluding to, details are so critical to making these stories come alive. So um, you think about the visual of James um, and his leotard as a kid, talked about his blue shiny hot pants, practicing the pirouettes. I love like the feeling of like, that he talks about the wood beneath my feet. Um, like those having those sets of details help people to actually live into the moment of your story. As Ruth talked beautifully said, it was kind of like I'm watching a movie. It's like you're there. Um, great, so I wanna share, ah, I want to share another story of uh, story of self here. This is a brief two minute video that just focuses on the story of self. Um, here we go. So it's January 4, 1998. I think it was a Sunday and I was 16. All my friends were getting ready to go back to school after winter break. They were worried about papers, ACT, college choices, spring sports. I was in a hospital bed holding my newborn baby girl. My journey to becoming a teenage mother was long and tiring and scary. My dad had been killed seven years before that as he worked for the United Nations in Lebanon and he was killed on the job in the Civil War. Becoming a war orphan put me in all kind of circumstances that the ambitious, strong, determined me would not have ever placed myself in. I was in that hospital bed, feeling like I was a loser. My life was over. I was somebody with no high school education, who's now in charge of raising a child, and I felt so sorry for myself and my baby because I'm helpless. And what do I have to offer? I looked at her and she looked at me with this look, like, you are the most powerful person I know. I'm the only person I know. <laughs> and at that moment, I realized that victims can only raise victims. Helpless people will only raise helpless people. And people with no choices will only raise people with no choices. And that's not what I wanted for my child. At that moment, I decided I would no longer call myself a war orphan. I will no longer be a person who allows things to happen to them. I will make choices for me for my daughter, and for any woman who finds herself placed in circumstances that are out of their control. All right, so we're gonna go into breakouts in just a moment. Um, but I wanna, I wanna highlight, um, there you go. I wanna highlight just a couple of things um, uh, about this story. One was, where she begins. She's talking about uh, uh, her, her experience starting thing in 1998 um, when she was 16. She's talking about her friends preparing for the, uh, uh, you know, preparing for the, um, preparing for the act and while she was in a hospital bed holding her new, uh, her new daughter. So the challenge here, is just being a 16 year old with with no uh, 16 year old parent with no support system very clear challenge in here the choice are is arm am i am i am all just going to let the circumstances here dictate what happens or am i going to take the opportunity right to exert my own agency even in this most difficult of circumstances and the outcome is that she decided to claim her own agency um one of the things that I think she also does well here, she really like talks about the details of the hospital bed and the setting, the moment that she's sharing with her newborn daughter. Um, 
And it's a great sort of, it's a great demonstration of showing uh, and not telling what happened, but show, showing, showing what happened. Great. So um, we want to go into, into breakouts. Uh, so I think Xander is setting up our breakout, uh, breakout teams. Um, we are going to uh, do a few things in the breakouts. One, we're going to just gather for a few minutes um, and review the agenda here. Uh, and then you're going to take five minutes uh, to silently develop your just your own story of self. So this is the really the expectation is, is you're starting the writing and the thinking through today. You're identifying the the challenge that you want to uh, be focused on, the moment that there are moments that you experience that challenge, the choice that you had to make, and the outcome from that. So you're just sort of putting together the narrative structure of this. Um, and then we're going to do uh, a round robin. Um, you'll have a couple, you'll have two minutes to share uh, what you've come up with. And then there'll be a few minutes of coaching, uh, both from your coach and then from your uh, supportive uh, colleagues. And then we'll um, take a couple minutes right at the end of the breakout for you to just, you know, look back at your feedback that you've been getting and incorporating that feedback um, into um, into your story. Um, great. So Xander, are we ready with the breakouts? We are. And I know that you've been uh, presenting, so I don't believe you've had a chance to look at the chat, but we have some really important and good feedback. Okay. I think we should sure. we should take back when thinking about the examples we share. Sure. So just want to specifically name that to know that that's not lost. Okay. Great. Thank you, folks, for sharing your feedback. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yes, we you'll get an invitation to join a breakout room, and then you are in Maryland. You'll stay in the main room. Great. I'm just looking back at the feedback. Thank you very much, folks. Uh, some folks who have been asked to share their story of self. So you don't have to if you don't want to. Uh, uh, <clears throat> but uh, let me start off with uh, with Xander, with Xander's team. Any Is there anybody from that group that wanted to share their story? Yeah, they, sub they're subjecting me to it. Um, so I'll oh. go ahead. <laughs> So for it was yours, Allison. Thank you. <laughs> yes. So for me personally, um, it all started back in high school. Um, I saw a YouTube video of Lauren Singer, and she managed to get a year's worth of trash in a single mason jar. And so after that, I kind of like deep dove into zero waste, where that's all I would watch on YouTube. I was like checking out books at the library about it. Um, and for a solid 24 hours, I was zero waste. And after that, I realized that there is no way I can manage to continue doing this. And so it was kind of at that point where I looked beyond myself and I was like, okay, what is something I can do more than just my individual actions and choices? And so that was really like when I first found organizing as a concept. And so now like a big thing for me is just finding the balance between individual goals and like aspirations of obviously I'm still like conscientious of my trash and my waste um, and all of that, but also acknowledging that there's never going to be a year in my life where I only have a mason jar worth of trash. Um, and so just finding the combination of individual and collective action has been really powerful for me. Um, and so, yeah, that's my story. Round of applause for Allison. Thank you. <laughs> Great story. So much. Kind of like trying to live without plastic for one day. It is impossible. Yes, I nearly so impossible. Um, Allison, can I, can I give you some coaching? Oh my gosh, of course. Thank the, all right, thank you so much. Yeah, I, first of all, a great example uh, of a moment 
a, a very specific challenge in a very specific moment. Um, and that's exactly uh, the type, that's exactly the thing that we're looking for here. Um, and so I really want to give actually mostly just a kudos uh, uh, about that because that's that's the key to unlocking a great story of self and you've and you've already got that there. So congratulations on that. I uh, appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, and um, and I think uh, what I'm really curious to see is uh, is when we get to the story of us training in the in a couple in a couple of weeks, the the us how the us develops into your story of self. Um, so it's not immediate coaching for right for right now, but as you're hearing the stories from other people and building the relationships with the folks that are in this cohort. I know you're going to identify shared values and shared experiences that you can tie into the story of self that's hopefully going to call other people to be uh, joining the movement for zero waste. So just thank you for that. That's a really great example. Um, okay, uh, let's go with uh, Naomi. Does the DC team have somebody? That would be me. Is it is it Kara? I'm gonna. Is I'm gonna read. It? Is it Kara um, or Kara? Kara, I care yeah, Kara. about the environment. Kara. Kara, great. Please, Kara, go ahead. Um, it's not about climate. I'm just saying. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. After graduating from a pricey private college, no decent job prospects came my way. I found myself living at home and working at a sporting goods store. When Julie Hennigan, a high school classmate, came in to buy shoes, she really looked down at me, even though she hadn't even gone to college. Little did she know, I had already secretly decided to save up as much money as I could and go live in Costa Rica to immerse myself in the language and truly learn it. Yeah, I had majored in Spanish. With $700 saved, I got my plane ticket and off I went. I stayed for nearly three years, supported by myself by being entrepreneurial. I taught English. I gave tennis lessons. I even opened an aerobics gym. Yeah, it was a while ago. Teaching hadn't really been on my radar as a career because of all the negative connotations around it. You know, low pay, no respect. However, I found it to be quite fun and rewarding, not in the monetary way. So that's why when I came back, I got my degree in education. When I was in graduate school, we were informed of an opportunity to join in the Peace Corps at, in a partnership to complete our thesis on our work there. I jumped at the chance. I really wanted to serve my country, but not in the military. Peace Corps would be perfect for me. Since I had proven myself as someone who can live overseas for an extended period of time and make myself useful, I got accepted easily. My job was to bring a radio literacy program into a new region in Honduras for adults. Due to the mountainous terrain, many adults living in the rural areas didn't have a chance to complete their primary ed or even start it in some cases. Maestro and Casa, my program, took them from where they were and helped them through the equivalent of grade school. A grade school education can be a life changer in Honduras. The teachers taught via radio from the capital city. The students used a notebook as they tuned into the class. Once a week, they met with others in the program, in their community, to review and reinforce what they were learning. I lived in a small village in a valley surrounded by the small hamlets where everybody was. I worked with agricultural extensionists, health extensionists, anybody and everybody. And that's how I got to know the people and places to introduce my program. It involved hiking up mountains, fording rivers, and eating a lot of beans and tortillas. But in the end, I was able to guide over 300 people to earn their primary ed diplomas and keep the program going in my absence. 
Thank you so much, Kara, for sharing that. Thank you, thank you. Um, uh, can I give Can I give you some coaching? Pre appreciate it. Thank you. So, there are uh, I, there. I love. I like particularly love that. Like you're talking about, you're taking the trip. You're talking about the moments of like learning Spanish, particularly like in the first thirty seconds. I was like really there. Like there is such. There's like such great detail in your story. I think that's really, really, really good. Um, and and also there's a lot of story moments in here and there's a lot of choices that you're making in my view, right? In each of these, in each of these moments, the choice to become a te like the choice to become a teacher, the choice to go to Costa Rica, the choice to, there's a lot, there's a lot of, a lot of choices in here. And I think uh, it came up also just in our breakout with uh, uh, where folks are like, I've got a whole series of moments that have brought me here. I'm in a constant state of becoming. And that's really the challenge of this of narrative is characters live in a moment and they have an experience and there's a challenge and there's a choice and an outcome. And so um, uh, I, I would encourage leaning into one of those one of those choices uh, as a demonstration of like the 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 arc that you have taken to get to where you are right now um so thank you for sharing that uh do we have uh uh one other do we have a person uh charles that you would like to share from dc as we wrap up or i also have i also have ruth from the maryland group so i think we can do do one more sure so um i'm gonna ask uh richard from our group if he would share um <laughs> richard um, yeah, and then if uh, you could be brief, I uh, want to make sure that we're able to to get through all of them. But thank you, sir. Appreciate you. Thanks for the heads up. Um, uh, so um, I'll, uh, my story is that um, I'm uh, I work in education. I'm a long term educator. I believe in education. I work with um, usually underserved students, uh, you know, uh, communities of color all my all my career. And uh, my wife and I were sitting down and looking at our, our my son's college fund. Um, we were, it was really important to us that so we had like figured out how we we're going to pay for college, have that all set. And I said to her, "What happens if we don't use this? What if he doesn't go to college?" You know. So we talked about that, and I was like, "But maybe he shouldn't go to college." <laughs> That's what I eventually said, and she was really shocked that I was here. This person who whose job was basically to, you know get, um, you know, uh, work with colleges and work with college students and, and kind of really support education was not, you know, talking the same talk with, with, with regard to my son. And I, and I said to her, well, I, I don't know, you know, I work every day and we talk about education, but we're not, you know, ed the, the, what I'm seeing is that we're not really preparing students for what the future that's coming. You know, I've been reading about climate change. I've been seeing uh, stories in the news and I felt like out in my job, I was preparing, I was tricking, you know, these institutions, these students into a, like a future, like it was just the same old future that we're going to see. We're going to get your business degree and you're going to get your, you know, psychology degree or whatever. And everything's going to be like it was when, you know, when I graduated, but it's not. And, uh, and it really was bothering me that, uh, you know, as I was really concerned about my, my son's future, but I was also kind of promoting this, this vision of the future. Uh, within my work. And so I wasn't sure what to do. And so I really went on a two pronged journey to learn externally. So it took some really like hardcore sustainability courses that I threw through the state of Maryland. And then I also worked with my organization to try to talk to them about climate change and try to get some uh, movement there, which, which ultimately um, it just wasn't happening. Uh, and this was like a, over five or six years. And so um, I, I felt like this is really the most important thing that we need to, that we're facing. This is the thing that we need all hands on deck. I can't just, you know, think that and not do something about it. And so well, I didn't have time to volunteer with CCAN and other organizations with my job was very demanding. And so I, um, this summer I just quit uh, my job and oh. uh, I'm trying to figure out a way, the best way to really prepare, really prepare students who want to learn, who want to build the future for us, right? But do it in a, you know, looking at uh, kind of the situation that we're in and thinking about climate change and thinking about how it's going to change the world and and what they can do and, and how they can do it. Wow. Richard, 
How how brave? How brave? Brave and stupid, yes. <laughs> um Richard, if I may, just for 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 thirty seconds, and I know we'll we'll wrap we'll wrap this up as uh, in the next couple minutes here. I apologize, folks, that we're take, taking longer, but I want to also give me some notes and honor the, the 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 stories that are in the space and the things that people are experiencing. Um, talking about a choice, my goodness, um, and uh, so. I just that must I, yeah. I know how difficult that must have been. I'm I'm like you're causing me to sink back to like career changing, job changing right. experiences, and those are very stressful and really hard. Um. So um, I think that the the details are there. Like I'm sitting there like with you, at the table with your wife feeling like a part of this conversation. Um, and I think the story is, your story of self is really quite there. Like you've got a very clearly articulated experience. Um, and I think that you're just gonna like get more comfortable with it and just pra like practice it, think it through, think through the details, like how you're feeling. And it's just gonna, the pieces of it are going to come together just with like practice and meditation on it. Um, so like the key pieces, the challenge and the choice or outcome and outcome are there. The visuals are there. The values about like what's mo what moves people to make significant life changing decisions are there. So thank you. Thank you, Richard, for sharing that. Um, are folks up for doing one more story? I know. I'm no, I was on. saved by the bell. <laughs> Where, I am going to keep go over. Okay. All right, Ruth. I totally get you on that. You're gonna have to uh, do a one-on-one -on -one with Ruth to get her story yourself. So maybe that's maybe that's the catch here. Build relationships. Um, okay. Well, thank, thank, thank you, everybody. Round of applause for everybody who just shared their story. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And and what is the end goal with these stories? Are we gonna do something with them again? What are we doing? That's so that's a that's a great question. That is a great question. Um, so that's leading me into what's coming up next for this. Um, so the let me share my screen here. Okay. Give me one second. All right. Um, the goal here is that. Next, so our next training is a relational meeting training. So between now and our, the next, the relational meeting training, which is going to be led by our amazing co-facilitator today, Xander, um, he it's he, he's going to be leading a training on how to do the one-on-one -on -one relationship building. As a, a key part of doing great one-on-ones is being able to uh, both invite folks that you're meeting with one-on-one -on -one to share their story like what's what what's bringing them to this work what are they excited to what are they like why do they want why climate justice why uh why they want to get plugged into um the work that you've already plugged into uh and uh and a part of that is your story of self a part of that is being able to have a handful of stories in your back pocket that are genuine, real uh, stories that you can share as you choose in, in, the, in the relational meeting to uh, identify shared values that are going to help motivate this person to be taking action with you, to do something with you. So between now and next Tuesday, I would uh, encourage you to spend a little bit of time um, zeroing in on the feedback that you've gotten here today uh, and fleshing out uh, more of your story of self um, and uh, being prepared to share a part of that story of self um, with uh, the, the person or persons actually that you're going to be practicing the relational meeting training with next week. Um, so that's the connection here. So we're going to go from the relational meetings so the story of us, which is going to be the week of the 16th. So the story of us is actually going to be now that you've had these share the stories of self, you've uh, done relational meetings with the group. 
What are we identifying as the shared stories, the things that we have in common, the values, the stories, what's bringing us together? And then the last training on the uh, 23rd, I believe, is going to be the story of now. So what is it that we're that we are calling upon each other to do right now to uh, advance climate justice and just to make our communities a better place? So that's the arc, and that's how this connects. So you're going to continue over this next few weeks to refine your story of self. You're going to continue practicing it and building upon it. Um, between uh, now, though, and next Tuesday, uh, I invite folks to read pages 32 to 35 in your participant uh, guidebook that's on relational meetings. So if you're curious uh, to uh, to get a preview of what Xander is going to talk talk about, I encourage you to read those. Um, uh, and so I want to uh, invite who are nowhere late here. So if folks would like to uh, have a one-on-one -on -one practice with an organizer with myself, um, feel free to email us or you can go to this, uh, our Slack channel. Uh, everybody should have gotten an invitation in the email. Um, and you can feel free to do a direct message or just to post in the group chat there and just say like, hey, I would love to um, share, you know, do some practice or get some feedback on something. Um, specific regarding your story. Um, yeah, that's uh, that's really the next steps here. Any questions that folks have? Y'all, I'm so thrilled because this is the first time we're doing an organizing mini series at CCAN and we've got such beautiful and committed people in the room. Uh, there's nothing like this feeling of just building this the shared connection through story and relationship building. So I really appreciate folks taking a significant amount of time this month uh, to help build our relationships together. So thank you. Thanks everybody. Thanks. I'm gonna stay on for a few minutes. If folks have questions, I'll stay on for a few minutes. And stuff, I have a question. 